Welcome aboard the Boat Buyer's Secret Weapon Podcast, where we're dedicated to helping first-time and experienced boat buyers find the right boat at the best price so they can have years and years of boating fun because life truly is better on a boat. Today's episode, we're going to talk about boat buying basics for first-time boat buyers. Uh, This is specifically uh, entry-level, first-time boat buyers. I don't know much about it, so we're going to go real, real basic here. And um, I am your host, Captain Matt. So we are going to do a lot of video on this one. So you may want to, if you're not watching this on our YouTube channel uh, or on the uh, on the website, you may want to find it because we're going to look at some images to start off. Uh, if, if you kind of understand this part, maybe you'll be able to fast forward through it a little bit. So let's start with the basics. So I wanted to, I wanted to do an episode that was just really, really, really basic to just go through some, uh, some definitions for boat buyers. Now we're not going to be talking about bow and stern necessarily. Uh, we're going to talk about styles of boat to start. So you can see I have the images listed one, two, three, four on this page. They all look very similar, right? They're all fiberglass boats. They all have kind of a, a V shape on the bottom. Um, you may say, well, those are all those are all very similar. They're the same type of boats. But I'm going to tell you what's the difference of each of them, so that you can be more uh, informed and more confident when you go in. If you talk to a dealer, you talk to a, a broker, you talk to even a private seller you know some of the language and you maybe not be so intimidated. So the first one you'll notice is a bow rider, the the tan one in the top left corner, number one. The reason that's a bow rider is that it's a fiberglass boat. It comes to a sharp point up in the bow, kind of looks like a, a pizza pie shape up front with the very the very point of the of the um, of the front of the boat that goes back with some bow seating up front. That is called a bow rider. Now, the the propulsion of the boat on that particular one, you can see there's no engine hanging off the back of it. So because what I know about boats, I know that this boat is a stern drive or an IO, an inboard outboard engine, where part of the engine is in the boat. There is a, a portion on the exterior that sticks out, kind of hangs off the back of the boat under the swim platform, and there's a prop on it, okay? So that is a, a bow rider that's a stern drive or an IO. It, it usually will have a, a Mercruiser or a Volvo engine. This particular boat is a Sea Ray, but Sea Ray, Chaparral, Cobalt, uh, Bayliner, uh, Stingray, uh, Bryant. Um, there, there's a whole bunch of them that would fall in this category of a bow rider. Next, we have number two to the right. You can see again, it looks very similar but this boat is a deck boat. You can see in the front, instead of having that sharp nose that that comes to a point and looks real sharp, looks real sporty, kind of slices through the water, you can see this one on the front, it's almost squared off where there's a a lot more seating up front. It doesn't have that same sporty look to it, that sharp nose slicing through the water. And yet, if you looked under at the waterline, what was, what was impacting the water still has that sharp V. So this is a fiberglass boat. This is called a deck boat. You can see this particular boat has a, a motor hanging off the back. You can see kind of under that, um, that black bimini top, you can see that outboard motor hanging off the back. Now, a bow rider and a deck boat can both have stern drives or outboards. It just depends on, on what's right for you. Usually the the primary driver is, are you in salt water? Are you in fresh water? But there are some other considerations that we'll get into uh, in, in other episodes. But for this, for, for this particular case, just know that a deck boat just gives you a little bit more room. It's more spacious on the interior. It may have a swim platform or a, a place to fish off the front or for the kids to jump off in a, a ladder. Uh, off the bow of the boat. So that's the deck boat version. Very similar to a bow rider, very similar functionality, just a little bit more space, a little bit more um, functional for families because it's it's roomier, but you give up some of the looks, okay? Number three, 
this looks very similar to number one, to the bow rider. It's got that sharp point. It's a fiberglass boat. The difference between this boat is you're not able to see it, but it's the drive system, the way this boat goes through the water. Now, this is a wake boat, a surf boat, a tow boat, a wakeboard boat, uh, a water sports boat, whatever you want to call it. This boat has either a direct drive or a V drive, a true inboard, which means that the entire engine is in the boat. And the only thing that comes out is a shaft that comes out from the bottom of the boat and it angles down. And at the very, at the very end of the boat, there's a big prop. Um, that uh, will propel you. Now, a V drive, the, the shaft comes forward and then goes back. A direct drive, it, the motor's in the center of the boat and it just goes straight back. Most wake surf and wakeboard boats are going to be a V drive. If you're doing slalom skiing, you'll find that the motor in the center of the boat gives you a, a quicker on plane and, and a, a smaller wake is what you're looking for when you're when you're skiing. And if you're serious slalom skiing. So if you are a true, if you're a true water sports enthusiast and you're going to surf, you're going to wakeboard, or you're going to slalom ski a majority of the time, you're 80% of the time, you may want to swing towards this type of boat. A tow boat um, would be the most general category. Um, these are going to be your, your Nautiques, uh, your Mastercraft, your Supreme, Supras, Malibu, Moombas. Uh, Axis. Um, there's a, a number of them. I'm sure I forgot a couple, but the key is that they have that drive system. They're designed strictly for water sports. That is what they do absolutely best. And you give up some other um, functionality. They're not quite as fast on the speed. They typically don't handle the rough water as well, although some of them, uh, Centurion, um, some of them have a, a really deep V that does handle chop well, but they're designed for looking sharp, looking badass, and being very um, functional for water sports. So that is your tow boat, your inboard um, boat. Next on the right, number four, on the bottom, we have a jet boat. This is a fiberglass jet boat. There are some jet boats out there that are aluminum that they run in, in the rivers and in, in uh, the canyons in Arizona and, and up north in um, uh, Washington and, and Oregon area. But this is a fiberglass jet boat. Yamaha, um, Chaparral was making one, Scarab was making one. And this was a very popular growing segment. And you'll look, it looks very similar to the bow rider. It looks very similar to the surf boat, to the tow boat. The difference is this will have the engine or engines inside the boat. And instead of a, a unit hanging off the back with the prop, it actually functions just like a wave runner or a jet ski where it's sucking water in through the middle of the, of the uh, boat. And there's a jet drive that's internal that blows that water out the back and that's how it propels. Now, the advantage of this type of boat is safety. You don't have that prop hanging off the back of the boat. You don't have that outboard hanging off the back of the boat. There's nothing that um, that's gonna get somebody um, caught in that prop, which can be a, a dangerous situation if you're not paying attention. It's very safe if you are operating the boat properly. Um, these tend to be very quick. Uh, they get up and going very quickly, and they are fun, sporty boats to run. And you can get these anywhere from you know 17, 18 feet up to 24, 25 feet. And they are fun, sporty boats to run. They do because of the drive system. Uh, because of the way that mounts to the back of the boat, they give you easier access to the water. So that swim platform and the back of the boat, they usually put loungers there and you're really close to wa the water line. It's real easy to get on and off. These are great for people that do a lot of, of uh, going to the sandbars because you don't have that lower unit hanging off that's going to get you caught up. And you have that back of the boat that's a lot of fun and, and cool to hang out with. So that's the jet boat. So we've got bow riders, deck boats, tow boats, and jet boats, and some of the differences there. Now, let's go to another categories of, I'm going to say pleasure boats, because we're going to skip bass boats and aluminum fishing boats and things like that. <laughs> On this page, we've got a pontoon is number one, 
A cuddy cabin is number two. A yacht or sport yacht is number three. And then a center console, number four. And I'll, I'll tell you some pluses and minuses and define them a little bit. So the first one is a pontoon or a tritune. This one happens to be, it looks like a pontoon with the, the 50 horsepower. But a pontoon, it's like a big living room on the water. Today, you can get one that goes 15 miles an hour and just puts around on the water. Or you can get one that goes as fast as any boat on the lake with a, a 250, 300 horsepower and sometimes twin outboards uh, if you're willing to invest in the 100 grand plus range. What the pontoon gives you is a lot of capacity, a lot of functionality, um, and it gives you a nice, the, especially the tritunes, a nice smooth ride in choppy water. And you can go from you know 16, 18 feet all the way up to 30 feet. And, and now they're making ones that are super wide, a lot of entertaining. They have fishing models. Um, the, the disadvantages of the pontoon, it doesn't look like a fiberglass boat. If that's important to you, uh, the, the pontoon is something that is very functional. It's kind of the, the minivan of the boating world. It's very functional. It's very awesome, but it's not a sports car, uh, and you've got to be okay with that. I myself love pontoons. I think I think the uh, tritunes with a, a 150 or 250 horsepower um, are about for a family that is just into enjoying the water, doing a little bit of water sports, a little bit of entertaining, a little cruising, a little pulling up on the sandbar, uh, a, a little anchoring out. I think the pontoon does a great job and is a lot of fun for a lot of families. It's a huge growing segment as well. And there are a ton, a ton of different manufacturers. Number two, number two is a cuddy cabin. Um, the, the cuddy cabin is a boat that gives you a little bit of room on the interior that you can go down instead of having the bow open, you can go down under the bow of the boat, the front of the boat, and there's a little bit of a sleeping quarter, maybe a small head compartment, um, maybe, maybe a small sink galley, uh, maybe a microwave, uh, but there's just a, a little area that you can go down below. It probably doesn't have air conditioning. Um, so if you're, if you're in a hotter climate, it may not be a great fit. If you're further up north and there's some, some cooler temperatures, um, it, it can be a, a great uh, fit for people. Now, what you give up for having that cabin area is you give up that seating in the bow and what you're left with is just the seating in the rear of the boat. So even on a 24 foot cuddy cabin, you may only have room for four or six people. So it's something to consider there. These are typically uh, stern drives where it's a uh, part of the engine is in the boat and then you have that drive hanging off the back with the prop that um, makes it a stern drive or an inboard outboard. Number three, number three is a sport yacht or a yacht. Now we're getting into big cruisers. Now the, the front of the boat is inside, so you've got that big cabin, but instead of a cuddy, which is just a small little area to get out of the sun, on the cruisers, the sport yachts and yachts, that area gets to be big, where maybe you have a bedroom, uh, you probably have a, a full head, uh, maybe even a shower, maybe even a full uh, galley with a microwave and a sink and a stovetop and a refrigerator and an ice maker. Uh, and depending on the size that you go, they get real big. These are typically going to be uh, twin engines. Uh, as you get up above, let's say, 33 um, feet or so, uh, 30, 33 feet or so, you're going to start having twin engines. Uh, now they're doing some of these in outboards, which is kind of interesting at the coast. Uh, as you get up into the 40-foot range, they may start to be diesel engines, uh, which you need to make sure that you have access to diesel fuel uh, where, you, where you boat. These are going to be great for entertaining, for overnighting, uh, for, I call them a condo on the water. If you want to have a, a second home, but you don't want a second home, they're great for that. Uh, if you want to have a place to entertain and, and maybe have a few cocktails and stay overnight, it's great for that. There, It's the community of cruisers, sport yachts, and yachters, a lot of the community is done on the docks because you typically will leave these boats in the water um, and you'll typically be at a marina or a set of docks and there's a kind of a community feel and that's why a lot of people go towards, towards this style of boat. Um, and it can be a lot of fun. To overnight on your boat can be a lot of fun. And then number four 
is the center console. Very popular at the coast. Typically going to be outboards. As you get to, to some of the bigger sizes, 30, 40 foot, you may start seeing diesel. But typically they're going to be an outboard. Could be a single, double, triple, or even quad engines, depending on the size. Great for going offshore fishing. Uh, they're, they're starting to put some comfort packages on, which are, are good for families that want to do some fishing, uh, want to do some tubing and some water sports, and, and may just hop on the boat and run to the restaurant or, or the bar or, or across the way to visit friends. But the center consoles are great in the coastal environment because they're typically, they're, I don't want to say bare bones, but they're easy to maintain. You can just spray them down with the hose, get all that salt water off, any fish and, and grime and, and guts from a fishing outing, and they clean up real simple and easy, and um, they are, are great for that environment. Again, typically outboards, as you can see, that that black engine, hang, kind of black gray engine hanging off the back is a, a Yamaha um, outboard, and that is going to be typically the, the power that you find. So that sort of sets the stage. That sets the stage for some types of boats that pleasure boaters are going to be looking at, Okay. If you're if you're interested in bass boats and some of the others, we'll we'll do another episode on that. But as a first time boat buyer, why boating? You may be early in the process of thinking, man, we we've thought about boating. It seems like a lot of fun, but we just don't know much about it. It seems like it may be expensive. It seems like it may be difficult, um, and, and you know it, it's kind of intimidating. Well, I'll tell you, as somebody that grew up as a, a boater from a young age. Um, age five is, is when my family got our first boat and I, I've been around boats my whole life. Um, and obviously making it, you know, um, uh, a career <laughs> is, as, uh, as a huge part of my life. So what is it about boating that, that people love? There's a couple of things is one, you're getting out in nature it is your, you're getting that nature connection that we just don't tend to have as much these days. Um, you know, we're, we go to our, go to work, we're in the car, we're at home and we're just not out and about in nature, which is great, um, for your health. There's been some research studies by Dr. Wallace Nichols, and, uh, he talks about specifically the, um, your brain on a boat, why it relaxes you, why that water sound, um, you know, calms you down, why being out in nature gives you that release that, um, uh, that's so important to kind of recharge uh, after a, a busy day of traveling, of of working, of of you know running with the kids, and it's also a great relationship builder. So for boating, there's there's some camaraderie on the water that is tough to get uh, anywhere else with your with your kids, with your friends, with your neighbors, uh, with other boaters, and you'll find a community. I kind of talked about it with the cruisers. But it's even true in other styles of boating where you start to have your boating friends and you meet people on the boat. And typically, if you're out on the water, you're a friendly person. You're out there to relax. You're out there to enjoy. Um, and you're, you're ready just to, to have some fun. And so it's real easy to, to meet a good group of people uh, that will enjoy um, uh, being part of your boating lifestyle. There's other the activity you know, whether it's water sports or fishing or, or even tubing or just swimming and floating in the water, you're, you're more active. You're getting your body off the couch or, or out from the TV, turn it off Netflix and, and um, you're getting outside and being active. There's also a part of, there's, there's some learning. As a first time boat, boat owner, there's going to be some learning, which is great. You start to learn some new skills. You can teach your children responsibility. Hey, this is how we maintain the boat. This is how we be safe. These are some things we have to do uh, to enjoy the boat, whether it's have the kids clean the boat, uh, help tie up, uh, help with some of the um, some of the work that goes involved with being a boat owner. All of that stuff, um, it, it just kind of adds up to boating being a great activity uh, for people that are, are looking for something new to get out of their rut, to have some fun, to get some sun, uh, to get out in nature, to relax, to disconnect, all of that stuff uh, goes into buying a boat. And, and you'll find, I, I do a, an episode strictly on this, why boating, um, that, uh, that you might want to go back. And I'm trying to get uh, Dr. Wallace Nichols on the, on the podcast so we can, we can talk about uh, his, um, 
his um, research um, that that uh, he did. Oh, 2018, mid 2018 is when he when he released it. Okay, so next you have new versus you. So you know the styles of votes. You know why voting, and and hopefully I talked you into it. Hopefully it's it's something that you're seriously considering. Um, and I can tell you from personal experience and from helping hundreds and hundreds of, of voters that um, that it, it's a decision when you make the right choice on your first vote. It's a decision that it, as long as you are financially able, and, and that could be 150, 200 bucks a month um, to, to cover your, your total voting investment, um, it, it's something that can, can really have an impact on your life forever and your kid's life forever. That there's something about it that gets in your blood. So one of the first choices that you're going to need to make besides what style of vote is right for us is should we buy new or should we buy used? Now, I'm going to I'm going to suggest if you're a first time boat buyer, I'm going to suggest you look at both. You look at new, you look at, at used uh, because it's going to give you an idea of um, one what's out there for the price depending on what your budget looks like um you know new may be an easy decision to make financially for some of you used is the is the only decision based on the finances and the style of boat that you want if the budget's tight i'm going to say you know what buy a pre-owned boat buy that used boat and get exactly what is the right style the right size for you with the right options um, just make sure that you're being smart about it. And there's a podcast strictly on used boats that you'll want to listen to um, as well. So new, what's the advantages? Well, the advantages of new boat is there's not a single ding. You're going to buy it from a dealer and you're going to build a relationship with that dealer, which as a first time boat owner is going to be invaluable. Having that relationship with a good dealer, they're going to help train you on the boat. Um, they're going to help be a, they're going to be a resource for you. They're going to let you know what you need to know about maintenance, how to how to um, maintain the boat properly so it stays in good condition for years and years and you have good resale value. On the flip side, it's going to be more expensive. There's going to be depreciation. You're going to buy a new boat and the first five years have the most depreciation um, on a, 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 a depreciating asset like this. It's not a financial investment on the new side. And... Um, you're going to have to be okay with that. You're not buying a boat because it's a it's a wise financial investment. You're buying a boat because it's a wise health investment, relationship investment, stress reliever investment. You could spend that money on a vacation that's gone. Um, you know, as, as soon as you uh, you as soon as you arrive back from your from your trip, uh, all you have is the memories. Where a boat you can go every weekend uh, if you choose to. On the new side, something to remember is boats are very handmade. So even on a new boat, there may be some issues and you'll want to listen to the podcast of um, how to how to make sure you're buying the right boat um, that uh, is, is very valuable. You want to check that out. Now used, a used boat. Advantages is price. There, somebody else has taken some or a majority of the depreciation. When you're when you start looking at a boat that's 10, 15 years old, you know most of that depreciation, as long as it's in good running condition, most of that depreciation um, has kind of been used up. You just have to make a smart decision and find the right one. On the negative side, you could be buying somebody else's problem. There are a lot of things to know when buying a used boat that can catch you, whether it's a mechanical issue. Uh, whether it's not being able to get parts on an older boat, uh, whether it's a, an unknown um, uh, issues with some of the electronics, some of the equipment, uh, some of the accessories on the boat, all of those things, you want to um, you want to make sure that you make the right decision. Again, I'm going to refer you to the used boat buyers podcast that uh, how to buy a used boat that's going to help avoid those issues. But on the on the you side, you're able to get a boat that is maybe a little bit larger, is a little bit better fit that fits into your budget. So I really for for a lot of first time boat buyers, I encourage to look at use for another advantage, and it has to do with resale value. 
if you do make a bad decision in choosing the style of boat, or you realize after a year that there's a certain there's a certain direction that your boating lifestyle is taking and you need to make a switch, and, and it can happen no matter how much you plan and how much you think about it, if you are not right on the money and you go with a deck boat, but you realize a, a fishing pontoon would be better, um, or you go with the jet boat and you realize that uh, a tow boat would be best, or you go with the cuddy cabin and you realize that you really don't overnight on the boat and that cabin is wasted and you want a bow rider, those things can be very expensive if you buy a brand new boat and you try to trade the next year. If you go used and that situation pops up, great. You can sell that boat. It may cost you a couple thousand, ten thousand dollars, uh, or a small percentage of the price you paid, and you can move into the next boat and go go used again, or maybe go new at that time. And I think for a lot of people, that's a smart decision. Not everybody, because a used boat is going to have some issue. No matter how much you you uh, inspect it, there's not a used boat on the market that doesn't have a flaw or two. Uh, or multiple, a scratch. Somebody used the head compartment and and used the bathroom. Um, You're not exactly sure what the maintenance history is unless they have their service records. All of those things can have a little bit extra risk. And if you're on a very, very tight budget and you are locked in on the style of boat that you need and that new warranty is is, um, something that really appeals to you, then absolutely go new and um, just make sure you have a, a good dealer that you're working with that can help take care of you. That leads us into a dealer or a private seller. Now, if you're buying a new boat, obviously you're going to have to buy it from a dealer. I'm going to recommend and I'm going to, my advice is the dealer is as important as the boat itself. So especially for a first time boater, having that relationship with your dealer, um, having that relationship with your dealer can be the difference between having a, between having a, a great boating lifestyle and somebody to support you and help you through some of the learnings um, and being frustrated and um, and having issues and always having a, that question and no, no resource to go to. If you're looking used on the private seller, again, that dealer relationship, I believe, is really important, especially for first-time boat buyers because there's there's so much unknown. There's so many things that you don't know about the local boating area, about the maintenance of the boat, about um, operations and things like that. The private seller, the private seller, sometimes you can get a great deal. Sometimes you can find a seller that needs to sell the boat. They only have to sell one boat and they may not care too much about the money. They may be in a situation where they have to sell it and you can get a great deal. Um, they're a little bit more risk comes with that because you never know. They only have one boat to sell and they're not as concerned about their reputation. Most people I believe are honest and ethical and it's not an issue, but it could be an issue of they just don't know that there's a a problem. So again, follow the used boat buyer, how to buy a used boat. Uh, If you're going down that path, check out that podcast and uh, you can avoid a lot of the mistakes. But if you're going through a dealer, not only make sure it's the right boat, but make sure it's a good solid dealer that has a great reputation that you click with and um, that will be there for you as a, as a resource. Um, to pay up front or to finance. A couple of things on the, on the financing. If you're looking at a new boat, typically they're going to ask for 10% down. Um, and they are uh, typically, if you go with the marine lender, are going to finance for uh, 8, 10, 12, 15, or even 20 years. Uh, on some boats over over fifty or a hundred thousand, depending on what your credit looks like. So if you're financing, they can be very affordable. The reason they're able to go to those terms is they know that boats over the long period will hold their value. And typically, people that buy boats um, have the have the um, the income and the ability to pay. And they also, um, with ten percent down. They have that room. If something bad does happen, um, they can take the boat back and sell it. And the the lender is is paid off. And that's really what they care about. So the rates tend to be pretty um, pretty low, uh, not 0%, not 1% like you're going to find on a car that's being subsidized by the manufacturer. Um, but you can get a, a good low rate on most marine lenders right now as, uh, as 2019 
is um, is here. On a used boat, on a used boat, they may ask for 10 to 20% down. So they, they may ask for a little bit more. Um, the rate's going to be slightly higher. So look at that as you're looking new versus used is, you know, which one's going to give you the best monthly amount if you're financing. Um, another thing to think about on financing is if you go to a marine lender, they typically will go out a little bit longer on the term. If, if you're looking at a local bank, uh, local banks don't typically like boats because they don't understand it and they don't have a marketplace for selling them. They don't have the relationship with the dealers. If they have to repossess a boat, they don't know what to do with it. So they're typically going to have short terms and they're typically going to have higher interest rates. Now, on the flip side, a credit union, a local credit union can be a great option for used boats. If you're buying a used boat, um, some credit unions will say, you know what, we don't need any money down. We'll do zero money down and we'll do a, a longer term and have very low rates. So you want to look at all three options. Uh, if you're looking to finance, look at uh, a marine lender that specifically works with, uh, with boat loans, um, your local credit union that you have a relationship with on or, or start a relationship, and your local bank or, and your, your dealer uh, may be a source for a marine lender as well. Paying up front, just get it all over with. It's a depreciating asset. For financial planners out there, um, that's going to be their recommendation in a, in a lot of cases. Um, but uh, that's really a, a personal preference. There's other than not having a payment and saving that interest, the advantages of paying up front, there usually is not a cash discount. Um, it, it may be an easier transaction if you're buying from a private seller um, and, and you may be able to say, I'm coming in with cash, I can buy it tomorrow. And, and that could get you a little bit extra savings. Uh, but you'll want to check out the um, the bonus uh, for the negotiation technique at boatbuyer boatbuyerssecretweapon.com. I, I give you a killer finance or a killer uh, negotiation strategy uh, for a, a donation to the podcast that you that you'll definitely want to check out. Um, and uh, as you're looking at making sure you get the best deal, questions to ask as you're as you're looking at new or pre-owned. Um, you'll want to ask. You'll want to ask questions about um, the on a new side. We'll tackle that first. You'll want to ask questions about how they handle warranty. What's covered? What's not? What's the process if there is a warranty claim? How quickly are you going to get in their service department? Uh, what's their relationship with the manufacturer? Because that has a big impact on how you'll be how you'll be treated with a warranty claim. Um, those are, are some good questions to ask, and you might want to try to get it in writing, get an actual copy of the warranty. There's going to be a lot of legalese. Some of the vendor manufacturers have gotten good at, at making a, a simplified warranty uh, document that um, is easier for you to understand. But, um, you know, as with anything, the warranty is only as good as the company that's backing it. Okay, so just ask some questions about that. Ask some questions about the delivery. What's going to happen after I after I write the check or after I sign the paperwork? Um, are you going to take me out and train me on the boat? Uh, are you going to walk me through some safety stuff? Are you going to give me a, a, a maintenance rundown of what needs to happen? Um, what do we need to do for, for cold temperatures and freezing weather for winterization? Uh, all of those questions are things that you'll, you'll want to ask. And, and again, there's going to be a podcast on questions to ask a dealer that um, that you may want to check out um, in the in the future. Questions to ask a private seller. I, I go into this a lot in the used boat um, section, but you'll want to ask: Is there any issues with the boat that you're aware of that we haven't talked about? Just kind of a, an overarching question to make sure that there is is nothing that is being held back. And like I said, most people are honest and ethical. And the only reason why something would come up is, is that they just weren't aware of it, which is part of the risk that you take. Uh, but you follow the, the other processes in the, in the Use Boat Buyer podcast that uh, will, will avoid 95% of the issues and, um, and sort them out, especially the, the major ones. Other questions you want to ask is, hey, do you have a loan on the boat? Um, how are we going to handle the transaction itself? Um, you want to ask about the maintenance history. Do you have the maintenance records? Who did the maintenance for your boat? Did you do it yourself or did somebody else do it? 
you'll want to ask when's the last time the fluids have been changed, the oil and the gear lube, um, if it's a, a stern drive, and the impeller, if it's an outboard or a stern drive. When have those things been done? If it's a trailer boat, how old are the tires? Inspect the tires. That can be a, a, a additional expense that um, can, can catch you off guard or worse as you're driving home from, from buying it, you have a blowout or you have a, an issue with the trailer and, and that causes some problems as well. And then again, I'll, I'll revert back to the, the negotiation technique um, at BoatBuyersSecretWeapon.com. I give you the best negotiation technique that's going to save you hundreds, if not thousands to tens of thousands of dollars uh, when you're when you're buying your boat. And it will guarantee that you're getting the best price on that boat on that particular time that uh, you'll, you'll certainly want to check that out. So insider secrets. Some insider things that you need to be aware of um, on the new boat side. Oftentimes you'll find that a, a manufacturer will have rebates. It's a great time to buy a boat when there's a manufacturer rebate because it truly is a discount provided from the manufacturer and, and you really are getting that savings on the boat. It, it is true savings uh, in, the, uh, in the boating industry when there's a manufacturer rebate. When they go away, the manufacturer actually pulls it and the dealer doesn't get access to that money anymore. So, so be aware that you want to look at the manufacturer site and find out when that rebate goes away um, and make sure if you're making the, a decision soon that if that's the, the right boat for you, uh, that you make the decision to pull the trigger uh, and get advantage of that rebate or that incentives to maybe an extended warranty or something like that. There are some boats in the marketplace that the manufacturer sets the pricing. They'll call it nationally advertised price or, or map pricing. Um, and the manufacturer sets the price and that price is non-negotiable. They may even add some to that price for prep and delivery. You just want to ask that question and find out for sure if that's the case. If you see a price advertised all over uh, the internet on the manufacturer site in magazines um, and in other places, you'll you'll have a pretty good clue that that's the price and, and there's there's not much negotiation you may try to get a little bit extra thrown in again go back to that negotiation question and that could could be helpful there other insider secrets is no matter if it's a new boat right off the right off the truck or if it's a used boat never ever ever buy a boat without demoing it without taking it on the water and putting it through its paces and that means not just go out do a quick loop and come back that means putting it in the water and running that boat for a good 15, 20 minutes. Um, go wide open throttle. How does it sound? How does it feel? Go over some chop. Uh, go from a dead standstill to wide open throttle. How well does it get up on top of the water? And then go through all the systems, turn on all the pumps, hit all the switches, make sure that everything's working, even on a brand new boat. Um, boats are very much handmade in the, in the United States, which is great, uh, because it puts a lot of people to work, but there are times when a valve gets put on wrong or, a uh, something is not connected properly. So just do all of that before you write the check. Um, and you can avoid that first time out where you're finding a few things that, that need to be addressed. Um, it's, it's called a shakedown period. It's got a term in the, the bigger the boat, the more likely there's something wrong. So if you're, if you're buying a 40 foot, uh, sport yacht, um, you know, there's, there's probably five or six things that will need to be adjusted, um, with the boat before everything is hundred percent, right? That's just the way it is. And it, the earlier you can find those things, the better relationship we have with your dealer, the easier it is to get those, uh, resolved. That's why you need to ask the question of how is warranty work handled? So don't be turned off if you have an issue. Just try to find it before you write that check so you know what it is. And even if it's a brand new boat, do a thorough inspection of the boat before you write that check, before you sign the paperwork. I know you get excited, um, but I can tell you, I've heard horror story after horror story of people not doing that and, um, and having issues. So that's a little bit of inside, uh, inside info for you that um, will help to make sure as a first-time boat buyer uh, that you make the right decisions. And again, 
the the way we pay for this uh, podcast to bring you all of this information is by donations. And we give you a special gift when you make a donation of the amount of your choosing. You can go to BoatBuyerSecretWeapon.com and you can get the best negotiation tactic to save hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars. And, and for some of you buying bigger boats, even tens of thousands of dollars uh, on the price with this very simple negotiation technique. And uh, it's our gift to you for making a donation for all of the valuable content you're getting for free. And, um, and those donations are, are very much appreciated. BoatBuyerSecretWeapon.com uh, will get you to that page. And we very much appreciate it. And we would love to hear about the boat that you buy. Send us some pictures. And uh, we would love to see you on your boat and hear about how much money you saved uh, with that simple negotiation technique. So thanks a lot. And we'll see you on the next episode.